Welcome friends, sorry about that. I was just looking to see if it was working. It's Frank here from Talking Grace. And today's topic is, does the blood of Christ cleanse once and for all? Um, the answer to, to me is yes, it does. First John 1 John 1.7 says, The blood of Jesus Christ is God's, God's Son uh, cleanses us from all sin. Now there are two schools of thought, one like mine that believes that all our sins, past, present and future sins are taken care of, completely wiped out when you believe. The other school of thought is that upon conversion you have your past sins uh, wiped away but your current and future sins have not. You, you um, the idea is that that your sins can catch up on you if you don't ask for a daily cleansing of your sins before God. Maybe you keep a score, an account, I don't know, whatever, however you go about it. Um, and so people are not really guaranteed of their future. They're not guaranteed of their salvation. They have this idea that uh, they could lose their salvation or they won't know that they are saved until the day they die and then they're called out to be res to raised up and that's their that's the way they live their life and so in in order to maintain that position they do everything in their power to stay right with God by confessing their sins now th the problem with that is that's not how God deals with us God deals in a blood economy <clears throat> he did so with the, the, the nation of Israel and he does so today. Nothing's changed. What do I mean by that? If you have a look at um, the book of Hebrews chapter 10, it's, it's talking about the past, right? And, and now we know that the, the nation of Israel, the way they had their sin, sins cleansed was with the, the blood of the bulls and goats, right? Once a year, day of atonement, Day of Atonement came, 365 days, and that day they went to the uh, festival. They had their sins cleansed for the past year. They didn't do this every day, once a year. And so the writer of Hebrews makes a comparison from that event to Christ in, in Hebrews chapter 10. He says uh, this, The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming not the realities themselves for this reason it can never by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year make perfect those who draw near to worship so he couldn't perfect you as a believer see these these men wanted to these men and women wanted to be perfect as a child of god but they couldn't it was just a shadow then it says in verse 2 if it could, they would not have stopped. Yeah, sorry, if it could, would they have not have stopped being offered? For the worshippers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. And so we see here in the writer is just making that point. You know, it's a blood, it's a blood economy. They could have uh, had it done, sorted out, but they they couldn't. Not not under that arrangement. Something had to happen. And early on, we see Jesus Christ when he um, came to get baptized. Uh, John the Baptist, or after his baptism, John said, uh, "Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world." So we have today a perfect lamb in the person of Jesus Christ. His sacrifice rendered the temple ceremonies null and void. There is no longer any purpose for the tabernacle, the temple or daily uh, sacrifices. <clears throat> because Jesus Christ's sacrifice cleansed us once for all, not repeatedly over time there's no method or procedure required for us to remain forgiven we're invited to depend on the one-time sacrifice as the means to lifelong forgiveness uh, it says here in first peter three eighteen, christ died for sins once for all the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to god 
The issue concerning forgiveness becomes crystal clear when we understand this about God's economy, which is, and it hasn't changed. It's not about your verbal asking God for forgiveness. That's the, that's the recipe brought on by religion, right? After conversion, just ask God for your forgiveness of your sins. Sin, then ask for forgiveness. Sin, ask for, confess. Go to the elders. Do this, do that, do the works, right? Make up for it somehow. No, uh, Hebrews uh, 9 tells us how God de dealt with sin. Hebrews 9.22. It says here, where is it? In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. You notice? Without the shedding of blood, there is absolutely no forgiveness. So let's not get caught up with this, this school of thought that your words in somehow is going to activate or put into some sort of motion God coming down and saying, yeah, that I'm glad you said that. Don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with confessing sins. There's a place for it. But it's not not to not to have your sins forgiven because that's a one-time event, and when you believe, you are totally cleansed. Now, some people will then go to and say, "Well, look at First John one nine. Well, let's have a look at First John one nine real quickly. It says in First John one nine. Do I have it? Yeah. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from from all unrighteousness. Now, you might think, well, this is the verse that people go to and say, well, see, John says it. Let me ask you this, friend, from just your study of your uh, knowledge of your Bible, did the Romans get this unique verse? It's a very unique verse. It's not written anywhere else. Did the Romans get it? The Book of Romans? No, you say. So they had no idea that if they sinned that they needed to confess all they had to do was confess and i'll tell you why they had no idea because they believe when they sinned that their sins were forgiven past present and future right that wasn't on their radar at all because that's not how they viewed sin that's not how paul views sin at all so what is john talking about what about the galatians did they get this unique text no. What about those crazy Corinthians? Come on. I bet mean, anybody. I mean, the Corinthians should have had this down pat. Again, no. What what message did, did, did the Corinthians get? Well, it's interesting with the Corinthians, because a lot, a lot of people like to give them a hard time. But notice how Paul speaks to them uh, in 1 Corinthians When I can find the uh, text, it says, Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brothers, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, and called to be holy, together with all with all those everywhere who go on the name of Jesus Christ. Some other translations say who are saints. And so these Corinthians were saints or holy, set apart. And notice how he then says about their, their situation, what type of people they were. It says, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you know, he talks about those who will not inherit the kingdom from 9. But notice in verse 11, he says, and that is what some of you were. But you were, this is past tense, you were washed, you were sanctified, right? Sanctified, set apart, that means. So you were washed, that means you're forgiven of all your sins. You were set apart, sanctified, and you were justified. In other words, you were made okay with God. In the name of our Lord, Jesus Christ, and by the Spirit of our God. 
So God sanctified them. In other words, he set them apart. It's not an ongoing sanctification as some wanted to then claim. No, this is all past. Sure, our actions and attitudes are being sanctified, but not our identity of who we are. You see? And that's his point to the Corinthians. So the Corinthians, Paul doesn't say anything about this daily cleansing, confessing your sins, right? Doesn't say to the Galatians, not to the Thessalonians, nobody gets the memo. But 1 John. So what is 1 John about? John's attacking heresy. And early um, in that late century there, with 98 or whenever he wrote 1 John, he's having a go at these people, these unbelievers, because not everything written in 1 John is, a, is just centered to the believers. It's also centered, it's also an evangelistic tone in there, hitting the unbelievers who are getting caught up in a Gnostic heresy about sin and about Jesus. And in fact, if you start reading early on in 1 John, he talks, he describes Jesus in the physicality, in his flesh. And we may take that for granted, but look, back then there was this issue. Now, some of these Gnostics didn't think Jesus was in the flesh. I mean, how could God send a son in the flesh? It sounds ridiculous. And also about sin. They didn't believe that they were sinners. Not in the, not, you know, as in the physical sense. No, they, no, they were perfect, these guys, right? So he's, he's talking to them. And so where people get tripped up in 1 John is the letter we. It's a little word, but people get tripped up because they, then they, they're thinking, well, John is talking to the, to the uh, Christians, to the believers. But no, notice, notice what he says in the surrounding verse. If we claim, now this is from 1 John 1, 8, if we claim to be without sin. Now, what's the first step for a, for a believer, for an unbeliever? to claim that he's a sinner, right? But notice what he says. If we claim to be with without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So it's not in us. So is he talking about himself? The truth is not in him as well, right? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness purify us from all unrighteousness if we again if we claim we have not sinned we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives so because he's using the word we he's he's appealing in a very loving way to these unbelievers don't get caught up in this heresy so if we just believe, if we confess our sins, which is a normal thing for a, an unbeliever to do before he believes in Christ, is to say, yeah, I'm a sinner, right? If we, if we do that, he's saying, what is he saying in verse 9? He will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. But if we continue on this idea that we we claim that we don't have any, that we have not sinned, this idea, this heresy, you know, and then his and his word has no place in our lives, then we're we're not going to be okay. It's, we're going to keep away. And notice then in verse chapter two, he starts off, "My dear children." Now he's talking to believers, right? Initially, when he starts off, he's talking to you know, if he's saying to these heret these uh, unbelievers, if you want to have fellowship with us, you can. It's possible. What you got to do is confess your sins, that you're a sinner. So he's appealing to them. But in verse chapter 2, he starts off with, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. Ah. But if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. You see, notice how the change of tone now. My dear children, it's different now, right? You guys, listen. If you sin, 
it's not that Jesus is okay with us sinning, but what Jesus is, he's our advocate. He will defend us. In what way? He will take that accusation out of our head and say, you're okay. Like Paul said to the Corinthians, you've been justified. You're sanctified. You've been washed clean. You are okay to remember that. And that's where the enemy doesn't want us to understand. The enemy wants to think that we're dirty, rotten sinners. And he gets this message across from religion. Right? And this is why the the power of salvation is in the is in Jesus' blood. And the gospel senses centered around his death, burial, and resurrection is so powerful. And you're and and as a believer, when you understand that your sins are totally forgiven, that's a ball, that's a game changer, friends. That's a game changer. It's revolutionary to understand that. The other point I was going to mention is, uh, let me see if I can uh, bring it up, was regarding James, where James talks about, because some people bring this up as well, so I thought, did I, did I bring it? And as regards to the early Gnostics as well, in 1 John 4, 3, Because he, he, he says there, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard in coming and now is already in the world. So they, they didn't believe in Jesus. And so he was combating that sort of... Anyway, sorry. <laughs> So he, he was attacking those two, those uh, Gnostic ideas. Now, where is James? Where, you know that text where he talks about confessing of your sins? I had something written down on it. Okay, so when we talk about confess, means to say the same as or to agree. So believers should agree with God about who we are and about our forgiveness of sins. That God has taken away our sins, like he's about Jesus Christ, where he said, where John, John the Baptist said, he, he's the one that will take away, not just cover over. He remembers them no more. As believers, our forgiveness and cleansing aren't dependent on our memory, our confession, or our asking. Our forgiveness and cleansing are solely based on the finished work of Jesus Christ. And that's really important to understand. But James um, talks about confessing sins to each other in James 5.16. Let me get that for you, James. So we can have a... It says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. So James is saying here we should listen to each other's struggles, offer counsel where appropriate, and pray for each other. The context of James' exhortation to confess our sins to each other has nothing to do with God, with God forgiving or cleansing us. Confession to trusted friends and to God is healthy. It's normal and natural to talk about our struggles with people who care about you and me. Uh, the indes, the indes, indes, the, the, I guess the hardest thing to, to grasp, however, is that the confession uh, does not initiate cleansing of your life. We've already been cleansed, as Paul said there to the, um, to the Corinthians. And so once for all, through the one-time blood sacrifice that needs no repeating, uh, we can be honest about our struggles. But also, let's be clear about what Jesus accomplished through on the cross or on the stake. Uh, we know that different uh, groups have their different ideas concerning sins, and some have a mediation, some have the elders that they want you to go to, uh, whatever, and they're trying to put men in a certain position, say, well, these men are helping, uh, whatever. But misapply... But they misapply 1 John 1 as a spiritual bar of soap. 
Um, and, and so that view, we need to just push it aside. It's not what First John 1, 9 about, is about. God doesn't want us to think that human priests um, apportion forgiveness to us at all, if that's the case. Nor does he want us to envision his doing, um, doling out forgiveness from heaven on a first time, first serve, come basis. Instead, he wants us to ascribe real meaning to Jesus' declaration, it is finished. Only then will we turn from sins for the right reason. Our motivation should be to obtain forgiveness in return. Shouldn't, sorry. Our motivation shouldn't be to obtain forgiveness in return. We're already forgiven and cleansed children of the living God. Our, va our motivation should be the fulfillment that comes from truly being ourselves. And with that in mind, I'm going to then leave that there and go into my next topic next week about defining sin. But that's such an important subject, the cleansing, the one-time cleansing um, of our sins. It is done. It is finished. We don't need to worry about uh, there's no there, there's no strings attached. It's it's uh, unconditional. It's a gift from God. Um, he doesn't remember him. There's no condemnation. Um, um, so you know, there's nothing wrong with uh, talking about our struggles, like uh, like James says. That's a good thing, but that's not going to cause God or activate God in some way to wipe out today's sins, you know, so that in the future that's not going to come up because it's not going to come up. It's never going to come up. In fact, this, the scripture says uh, in Hebrews chapter 10 that he remembers our sins no more. And so that's what we have to remember. He remembers our sins no more. There's no point trying to, you know, God doesn't have a rear view mirror, you know, and, and sort of looks back. No, he, he, he just doesn't remember them anymore. And there's no point believing this idea that you're, you're a possible child of God. Your name is in pencil waiting to be written in ink. That's faulty reasoning as well. It doesn't work that way either. He's not doing that. He's not playing that game. Religion is playing that game to you and it's causing you frustration and headache to think that you're not certain about your life when you've accepted Jesus. If you've accepted Jesus, then you're a child of God. You're holy. You're cleansed. You're saint. Totally free from condemnation. Live your life as a child of God. And that's the good news. So, friends, I hope this has clarified something for you. If not, <clears throat> please leave it in the, the comments below. Thanks for your time, Jeet. And next time it will be on, I'm definitely going to leave, um, be talking about sin and the definition of that. Now, I had to wait because something came to me the other day. And I thought, that's I've got to say this. Now, unfortunately, with all the information I've got, it's just a, a lot and so I'm trying to just sort of now bring it down to a 20, 25 minute part as opposed to a 45 minute part, you know. So that's what I'm going to try and do the next week or so. Thanks, guys. Have a great day. See you later.